All right, Tracy, if you don't mind jumping on video and audio. Certainly. Tracy, I, I think you're, I think the most tenured guest that we've had to these types of conversations over the last, since the pandemic hit, certainly, but even, even prior to that. So uh, a big welcome back. Thanks for spending some right. time with me. Andrew, it's always great to spend time with you. Always uh, exciting conversations. <laughs> so, um, uh, for, for attendees, if you have any questions, please feel free to post things in the q and I'll be able to pull them in kind of live into our discussion. Um, my name is Andrew Farah. I'm uh, sort of the host of the webinar um, in the Workplace Innovation Series. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Density. We build systems that measure how people use space, um, particularly in the workplace. And I'm thrilled to talk to Tracy pretty much every time I get a chance. Um, uh, Tracy, who are you? What's your background? And then we'll kind of jump into to some of the debate. Certainly. Um, I'm v Vice President of Workplace. I work for Knoll. Uh, we're a furniture manufacturer, design forward thinking furniture manufacturer. 80-year-old um, company, which is you know, kind of ancient in some regards these days uh, from a company 10-year standpoint. Uh, my background is actually in industrial design, architecture. I had my own design firm for about 13 years um, uh, and then spent a lot of time uh, in the world of workplace strategy, which was this kind of niche uh, uh, operation for many, many years, and it's become kind of very um, uh, popular as of late. Cool. So... Um... When the pandemic hit, um, there were a whole bunch of opinions about um, how we were going to get back, how we were going to get back safely, when we were going to get back. So the prognostication machine was uh, pretty pretty substantial and intense. Um, fast forward 12 months. We, we spoke then. Fast forward 12 months. We're, we're speaking again. Um, vaccine distribution seems to be accelerating, um, at least in the US, mm -hmm. seems to be taking hold. And while there is another wave expected to show up of additional infections, it seems like people are actively preparing to come back to the office. Um, it seems really clear that like for those that are comfortable enough to, or, or, or are in positions lucky enough to be able to work from home, uh, that it feels like everybody's been working from home for that last year. But in fact, you know, 48% of folks have been going into the office or their place of work every day since the pandemic hit. Um, I'm really curious what your perspective is on what we're doing well um, as companies actually start to return and what you think that we could be doing better. Sure. Well, I, I always love the long arc of these things. And, and we've, um, beginning March 13th, we, we began a, a hosted roundtable. As a matter of fact, the Sunday of that March 13th with a company who said, I'm sending 194,000 employees home and in a not from work from home culture, what do we do? And I said, well, let's start with good bandwidth and you know, we're gonna work from there. But fast forward to your point, uh, 12 months later, a representative from that same company said, I don't think we have the right to tell people where to work anymore. So you look at that arc of thinking that's happened over those 12 months, I think that that really kind of epitomizes the arc that, that happened in the, in the thinking holistically from a workplace standpoint. Early on, I think to your point, we were very reactionary. We all thought we were going to be in plastic bubbles with circles around us and arrows on the floor. Um, and look at where we are today. I think some companies are taking very, very proactive roles in saying we've got to think different about space and the amenities and, and all the elements that will, quite frankly, create a good product that will entice people to come back to the office and make it a very compelling place to be. I think a lot of companies are kind of stuck in this corporate stasis where they're saying, well, we're really not going to change anything. We're going to put some policies in place. We may give them a good app, but, you know, we're expecting them to come back to the same space. And I, as a consumer, I would be looking at that saying, hmm, is that an attractive element for me? Is that something I really want to participate in? So I think some companies are, are really taking the thoughtful pr approach and looking at planning and looking at amenities and looking at the, the resources they need to, uh, to really offer an employee. And other companies are saying, well, we're gonna kind of get there somehow. Do you think, do you think that when, when that company said we've lost the right to tell folks where to work? It's, it's mm -hmm. a first time I've heard that sort of articulated that way and it's an extremely thoughtful comment. Oh, yeah, it was a brilliant um, one. It was one of the, yeah, one of the more, um, 
do you think that a part of, I, I guess, like, do you think that some of these organizations are happy to have lost that right? Like, meaning, do you think that th this is something that it is allowing them to see uh, large scale cost reductions in their second most expensive line item in real estate? Or, or do you think that people actually want to entice uh, employees back to the office? You know, I, I think it's too, as everything is, it's multifaceted. If you look at it, um, uh, I think there are some organizations that are very opportunistic in this regard and saying, hey, this is another opportunity to maybe cut some costs from our, from our overhead and saying, oh, let's, you know, you know let's, let's take some, take some real estate out of the portfolio. Um, as a matter of fact, in, you know, we just dropped a lot of research in the second or third week of March all around the thriving workplace. And some of the respondents said, you know, that they in significant, either some significant decrease in por portfolio, it was about 57% of the participants said that there was some significant uh, de decrease to the portfolio. So there, there's that one aspect of it. Um, but, but I also think this whole notion of portfolio and balancing is really just that. It's like, how do you, you know, the, the other aspect of, you, to this portfolio mix is really about collaboration and scrum space, ideation spaces, those things. Those things that are firmly cemented in a physical space, those just take up more room. So even if you decrease the density and increase, you know, those collaborative spaces, the net net is you're about this, you're about the, the same place. But, but this, but th this is, I guess, I guess maybe the, the heart of the question is, um, have we found a new form of working? Has the world found a new form of working? Uh, been, yeah. been, been forced to find a new form of working that um, is a net benefit? And, and like, what is the, what is, I mean, I feel like we're all being confronted with the question of what is the purpose of the office in the first place? And I heard this great answer to that question from, uh, from, from one of our guests, Peter Van Emberg, mm -hmm. where he said, there's work that you can do at home and there's work that you can do at work. And he gave this example of like, uh, demonstrating or demoing on this, you know, 170 inch screen, uh, Google earth thing that allowed them, him to walk through leases anywhere in the mm -hmm. world with a client live. It's not something mm -hmm. that you're going to do at your home as much as we'd all like 187 inch television screens or, or not. So I guess my, my question is like, we're confronted with this question of what is the purpose of the office? And I guess I would ask you as someone who is a deeply an expert in like what it means to be in an office and the culture associated with that. Um, why do we want to entice folks back? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it is, you, you, you said the magic word, it's, a, it's about that notion of culture, it's that, mo that notion of rituals. Um, I, and I think we have to think more broadly about what constitutes an office. You know, we look at it in the context of this broader ecosystem of the office. Yes, the physical destination is, is at the epicenter mm. of it. But, you know, you know there's, there's been incredibly robust work from home programs that have been put in place uh, since then. So I think certain organizations have noted that Yes, there are some things that we're doing really well at home that can that we can continue to support. Um, I think somebody said it's not so much that we're working from home, but we're living in our office, which gets really kind of icky, you know, when you think about it that way. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the notion of of those different work points, whether it's your home, whether it's a, a community space, that third space, I think is going to continue to to rear its head. It's going to be more vital moving forward. Um, but then also co-working spaces or spaces of service. I think we'll see, we'll see some, you know, some traction around those. So I think the definition of what an office is has just expanded greatly. Yes. Um, and I think the people that, you know, and this is where it gets a little odd, the people that are in charge of managing the portfolios then now have to think more broadly about what that ecosystem is and, and what, what their role is in supporting those various work points moving forward. So um, you have these awesome numbers about utilization rates prior to the pandemic mm -hmm. um, versus expected utilization rates of uh, post pandemic. And, and I'll just frame this with uh, some, some data that we heard from previous guests. Um, uh, Twilio is going from uh, 5% remote to 40% remote expected remote um, mm -hmm. when they're, when they're back. Um, you know, I think guest after guest I've heard going from, 
100% assigned to 100% unassigned seating. Um, huge portions of their employee base uh, opting to do some type of hybrid approach where they're going in a couple days a week or mm -hmm. they're predominantly working from home. And so I, I guess my, my question is that you, you had these awesome numbers about pre-pandemic utilization. Um, what is your take on, like, <laughs> how do we do better than that I mean, anything would have been better than that uh, as far as, you know, and so it's like, how do we do better than that when the demand for that space, when the customer, I think you described the occupant as a customer, when the customer for that and their mentality on what that means to them and how important it is, um, has changed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Our, our statistics are, are post-pandemic workforce is about roughly 14% going to be fully remote. Um, and so fully on site is roughly... 30%. So if you look at that and say, okay, that, that puts us at what, 56% uh, that is in this world of hybrid. I mean, hybrid what? I don't know. We keep banishing this word around. Yes, I don't think it yes. Is, 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 is a hybrid I want to come back to that. I want to come back to that. We'll come back. We'll come back. But I think to your point, you know, and I, and I think there's, there's, this, there's this, this mindset. We have to manage this. We have to manage this experience so tightly. And I, I think where you were going to is like in pre-pandemic world, if it was managed so tightly and your net result was only 40 to 57% utilization, I would say that wasn't such good management. You know, that was, you know, so how could we do better than that? Well, you know, is there a model that could be more open and more democratized to the work workforce? So they have more of a, a, the latitude to, to come in. You know, some companies are talking about okay, we want your projections of how many times you're going to be in the off or how, what's your propensity to coming into the office if you need to be there three days a week or four days a week or that type of thing. But it's already putting a, a, a measure in place. It's sure, putting sure. structure in place. It's saying, well, wait a minute, I want to come in when I want to come in, when it makes sense. I know that little free range is a little bit difficult for people to get their heads around. Um, but but, you're, wait, but, but wait a second, wait a second. You are a professional designer. Like you, your background is in design and great designers will all acknowledge that constraints are everything. Like what is the problem space? So what is the difference between uh, over management three days a week, as you described it, mm -hmm. and good constraints for how people think about uh, modeling or creating structure for people to come back? Well, you know, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, which is the well-designed space. I, you know, I, I'm going to, you know, once again, flashback, I think people have this, this ability to forget all of our nightmares pre-pandemic, you know, but we had nightmares there then too. One of which, you know, people couldn't find a place to meet, you know, everybody was in the office and nobody could find a place to meet. And oh, by the way, the, the, the meeting space was not well designed and, and tricked out to really facilitate a virtual meeting or a collaborative meeting. Well, okay, now we have, you know, a, a whole, you know, subset of our population that is going to be fully remote. And how do we make sure that we keep an equity level for them so that there's not this hierarchy between the people in the room and outside the room? So how are we thinking about those meeting spaces? So to your point, how do we create the, the, either the meeting spaces, the environment, the well-designed space that attracts people to it that may have some you know, latitude? You may have to over-provide a little bit of space. I know that you know, you know, in the corporate real estate world, that's not something when people want to really hear, but you may over-provide space so that people can have access to it when they're there. Can you give me some practical examples? Um, like what is that? What is that? end up being like how does the space go from to, give me give me the give me the before after right like the the here's what it was before here's like what great a great new design a simple example of like what a great great um uh sort of progressive implementation might look like i, I i'm, I'm going to use an analogy because it, it dates back to 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 some things that we, we looked at you know in working with a company in in the south bay it had to do with water consumption back when they were providing bottles of water. Okay, in 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 their models, in their in their kitchens, they had glass door refrigeration for water bottles, and they had a single refrigerator there. Water consumption was through the roof, and the person managing this didn't really understand. It was like way out, way beyond what the population should should really want. I mean, these were like. You know, they were like camels. Extremely well up. hydrated teams. Extremely They're well probably hydrated. really productive too and very, very, very high energy. 
but they, but in observing the behavior, they were hoarding water. So they what happened is they'd see the water in the, the, the refrigerator with the glass door and see if the volume was coming down. So they would start taking more, more than they mm. needed. They added another refrigerator with the you know clear glass door. Volume, the perception that it wasn't going to run out increased, water consumption went down. So it's this whole notion of how do you provide the right you know, perception of the product that is going to be enticing to the various work modes that people need in order to, um, to fulfill what their, their tasks are. You know, and the fact that so many people would tell us, you know, they're not coming in the office to just sit at a desk and check email all day long. They're there to collaborate, they're there to scrum, they're there to, to use the old language and it's kind of creepy in turn, current parlance to rub shoulders with people that they, they really want to belong to. Um, and that is what has been missing, that you know, it's easy for a, on a department to department basis to, to host a meeting. I can get you know, my teams together on a meeting, no problem. But it's that interdepartmental kind of uh, synergy that the office was so important in fomenting that is gone, it's just lost right now. I'm thinking, I, I, like okay. I, there's a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot of, um... So the, the world is, the world of workplace is enormous mm -hmm. and getting folks, I mean, in software development, in, in an industry where we are uh, oriented towards uh, building new things, getting folks to care about the glass doors and like mm -hmm. the importance of perception or engagement or a lack of engagement based on how an interface is designed is hard enough in an extremely like we're prog where progressive is almost the definition of the industry and technology. We struggle with that in real estate, which I would say is often in a, in a different part of that spectrum. There's only ever going to be some portion of workplace that is able to like meaningfully engage in those types of conversations or even have the resources to have those types of conversations. So how, how do you, and I asked you this question when we were preparing, but like, it seems like Noel and Tracy Weimer um, would love nothing more than to democratize giving a shit about design. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious and great space design. So I'm curious, yeah. how do you do that? Um, it, yeah. it, and, and not be relegated to just like the, the beacons of real estate design, you know, or, or mm -hmm. space design. Well, you know, we, we try to do that by engaging, uh, you know, I, I think you talked about it earlier that there's all these micro trends that are occurring. And I, I think, how do you engage with in a thoughtful manner with people uh, on, a, on a community basis and say, okay, let's better understand what you're, what you're grappling with. How does this make sense? How, do we, how can we aggregate that, that into some, you know, some broader findings? And we present that information from a, from a research standpoint, but for us, it's also the application of that. I think this is, this is where we, we, we kind of cross the line and we go into the application of it from a planning and design standpoint. This is what the space may look like. This is what the, you know, this is, these are some of the visual cues that are putting in. The notion of, for example, when, when we return to an office, you know, circulation and wayfinding are going to be very big. Um, you know, we've all done the, the, what do we call the sidewalk shuffle as we're in walking down the sidewalk now where we're kind of like, oh, okay, you know, making way, giving space. Creating generous circulation. Now, you know, having an eight foot or, you know, circulation path in a real estate world, they're saying, wow, that's wasted space, but it's not wasted space. It's comfort space. It's that space that allows people to comfortably pass by one another in a double loaded corridor. It's doing delineations that are wayfindings that say, hey, I know where to go based on this delineation, based on this wayfinding cue, and that is my neighborhood. So this whole notion of really more personable neighborhoods that are being deployed. It does two things. It's, it not only gives you know, team identity to that neighborhood, it gives the, you know, the folks that are wanting to manage that ebb and flow, it gives them flexibility on a more scalable basis to manage that ebb and flow within a neighborhood. It just gives that intimacy to it that we're, sometimes we lack. Um, your audio's off. Sorry, it sounds like these are, um... Uh, these are th what you're saying is that you're advocating for things that you've been advocating for for a long time sure. and that the pandemic is creating an opportunity to think about space 
uh, and perhaps make use of the, you said 56%, I think was uh, under, uh, you know, was used um, mm -hmm. pre pandemic 40 to 60. Our, our numbers, I'm biased, but like our numbers are even more dire. Uh, but I would just say, um, uh, are you saying that we've made, we figured out how to allocate that additional 60%? This, this huga of like, of, of, you know, we, we, we create comfort for people or, um, or, or like, I guess, what are, what, are, what are you saying? Because it seems like consolidation is going to happen. Um, yes. and, and, and what you're, what you're describing is not limited to safety. It seems yeah. encouraged by safety and maybe a response to safety in the pandemic, but ultimately you're talking about things that have to do with culture and like team association. Well, you look at it, okay, take safety as a, the starting point. And then you go through the lens, lens of, you know, such as universal access, inclusive design. So those types of things. Typically, once again, from a, from a space allocation standpoint, it's more generous. You know, something about adding a degree of humanity in design. You know, some of the, the key characteristics that we were able to garner from our, our roundtables experience had to do with things like restoration the restorative quality of being in an office, you know, and, and what does that mean either from an outdoor space or biophilia, that's a component of this. Um, also the notion of equity. And when people come back, you know, here, you know, Andrew, mm -hmm. we're all, you know, we all have the equal size screen, right? But how do we translate that equity once we return and a subset of our population is not returning. So how do you balance that physical virtual experience to make sure that there's equity as people return? So I think there's so many elements that design can influence to make the experience better. And in turn, if you're the consumer, which is the worker, that product looks better to you. And that's a more attractive product that you want to participate in and be part of. Gotcha. Um, there are a lot of predictions and prognostications about the percentages of people that will come back, about the days that they're going to use or not use, about the number of the 13%, 14% that will be fully remote, the 30% that will actually use the office. Um, are these useful guideposts or are we all just kind of guessing? Um, I don't mean to be a downer. I'm just sort of curious, no, like, no, no. A, you know, like, are we, are we, are, are we just kind of guessing and this is a temporary period and like, yes, there was an opportunity to potentially improve the structure and design of spaces, but either you're going to engage in that and see that opportunity or you're going to let it pass and you're going to get back to, look, this is bottom line decision making to some part. And hmm. if I can get the same type of productivity at half the cost uh, from my employees, then, and the employees are happy, I guess, like why? And, and, and actually, maybe, that, maybe that's, the, that's the heart of the question. What is the line between an employee is, there's a cost to an employee and mm -hmm. this is actually uh, ultimately to, to their benefit? You know, and, and I'd put it in that in that structure, you know, the, the, the cost of, of human capital within an organization is the number one cost. Mm -hmm. You know, real estate, you know, is second, but it pales in comparison to the to the human capital cost. So I, I think what incremental investments can you make in the real estate? And, and I'm just as a representative of a furniture manufacturer, furniture is even way, <laughs> way further down on that cost spectrum than, than the real estate. So what is that incremental investment that you feel the employee is worthy of to create these environments that make a space viable to them? What we're running into now is so many, there's employees are saying they didn't, they don't know if they can come back and safety. Yes. Is a key concern because there's not clear guidance many times, either from a municipality standpoint, this was a big thing. You know, we, we try to, we, we try to adopt these global responses each as we've learned, each municipality is having unique uh, directions as far as whether they can occupy a space or not occupy a space. So we could almost make the premise that each site is going to have to have its own kind of modeling in place to mm -hmm. support what the municipality may have to offer. So it may be a global portfolio that people are trying to manage, but there may be micro aspects of that that become so important to really understand the needs of, uh, of, a, of yeah. a certain community. I mean, we and look at this a, a lot from when we, when we do clients around the globe, how do, you, how do you really embrace local cultures to make sure that, yes, it's reflecting a global brand, but it's also respectful of a global, uh, of a local culture mm -hmm. within that global brand. Yeah. And, and we've, you know, we, uh, this, this, this is a, uh, this, this rings true. You know, we, we were talking to 
uh, one guest who had done sort of a, uh, they had a national maximum, safe maximum of 40% across all of their spaces, but then would adjust regionally based on local ordinances. Um, you know, there's there's another guest who, um, you know, they design buildings and spaces in they have 16 different countries or something like that, 12 different countries. Each of those offices are designed with a corporate standard, but then you layer on the local culture. Um, and this is true, I think, even with Twitter, I've, I've, I've heard some you know, this kind of love where you work concept where um, you sort of trying to design these spaces that in incorporate local. But <clears throat> I guess like, I'm not hearing a ton of things that are different about what we've wanted workplace to move towards uh, for some time. And so it's like, what is, what is the catalyst for those? What is, what is the thing that will ring true to a sea level team um, mm -hmm. when, when uh, you're hitting your numbers People are burning out, but you're hitting your numbers. Uh, you, you, none of you, you're at one percent utilization across uh, a a ten million square foot uh, corporate portfolio, mm -hmm. and you're trying to say, well, I can now my, my half my teams that are remote right now want to move to not San Francisco and New York. Mm -hmm. So my cost of so I'm going to not only be able to drop thirty percent, forty percent off of my like Jamie Diamond was mentioning with with um with the bank, but 30 to 40% of my real estate, I can also see a cost of living adjustment for, for those folks. And then I can try to use those dollars to invest in, in the home. Um, mm -hmm. And so actually that brings me to a question that came up uh, in the Q and A that mm -hmm. I think is really good. How do you, what type of design strategies essentially do you recommend to provide equity between physical and virtual experience? We were talking about this of like, you know, you've got a meeting in person, how do you figure out how to create a level playing field for, for both folks? Yeah. We've been doing a lot. I mean, we've been actually workshopping with this and, you know, and it, we know enough about the tech to be dangerous, but we're looking a lot at cameras, field of views, the multidimensional field of view. And then also what is becoming so important is the audio. And whether you're going to, a, if you will, a centralized audio strategy, like a soundbar type of thing, yeah. or a decentralized audio strategy, which is distributed speaker mics. Uh, we're finding a lot of success uh, with uh, some of the Bluetooth speaker mics. So not only are they distributed, and it, it does two things. You know, people talk about, once again, one of the nightmares we had pre-pandemic was sound and acoustics in space. You know, well, you know, that hasn't gone away because we haven't really, we haven't, we haven't really touched it. But if you go to a distributed audio strategy, then all of a sudden, the overall volume comes down. You people don't have to feel that they're shouting to a, a one location, like shouting to a microphone. So it lowers that overall acoustic, if you will, energy in the space mm. and gives a richer experience. And also we're, we're actually taking cues from almost like mini theaters. Um, as, as you know, we were presenting you know, this thriving workplace, we modeled it from a VR standpoint. And so we have what we refer to as these fidgetal kind of meeting spaces. And we, we kind of made the premise that and the reaction from a, one of the tech clients we were sharing this with is, so you're saying maybe a rectangle with another rectangle screen at the end isn't the optimum layout for a, a, a meeting? And I'm saying, well, there's probably some improvements we can make. So we're looking at things like pivoting lounge chairs in a front row, a different a, a, a tier behind it. That's almost like terrace seating. Um, taking cues from like mini theaters and it's mm -hmm. it's two things it's more immersive from the digital side but it's also just more human from the physical side people can kind of pivot in their chair and connect um, there's all these studies about you know a right angle isn't is kind of almost putting people at odds versus a softer angle uh, makes them feel more connected um, so mm -hmm. Things like that. Things like that we're really trying to address. The, the, so the I know that we're at the 30 minute mark and I know that there's some folks that are going to need to drop for other meetings. We're going to keep going for another 10 minutes or so. If you have questions, okay. uh, please feel free to toss them in the Q&A um, and I'll, I'll make sure that I work them in. Um, so uh, hoteling and mm -hmm. sort of the theory of hospitality inside the workplace. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the number of folks that might be looking at bottom line stuff. This is an example in which I actually think the two uh, sort of cost reduction and progressive design thinking are, have the same incentive, which is how do we create spaces where you overall have access to more space types as an individual, but mm -hmm. less ownership over any one individual. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you see organizations going from 100% assigned to 100% unassigned, 
my, I guess my question for you is um, how sustainable is that and where does that drop off? Is it specialized work? Is it uh, particular types of industries like legal? Is it C-level teams who need private offices? Like where does that start to drop off? And in an mm -hmm. ideal world, what could this look like if you could just snap your fingers and, you know, yeah. make the change? You know, you know I, I think there's uh, that, that, that model you just explained, that's a demonstrative shift for people going from, you know, fully assigned to 100% unassigned. And I think there's gonna be um, pinch points along the way to get people mm -hmm. to, to really understand that. Because, you know, people are saying, hey, yes, I want all that latitude. I want that freedom of space selection. But by the way, I want my desk when I show up. You know, one of my colleagues though said, um, I don't know necessarily think I need my pictures because the people I care about, I've been around for the last year and a half. I don't need pictures of them on my <laughs> desk anymore, which I thought was a brilliant, a brilliant observation. Um, but I think that notion of, of in everything, we're looking to, you know, to we can't leap to the next to this and saying this is going to be a, a solve all solution. It's, you know, how do you iterate and how do you almost like the municipalities. How do we make sure that we understand what community you're working with? To your point, what, what's the nature of the work they're doing? What's the nature of team? Let's say a team has a project, you know, ramp time of like six months. So they need a certain type of space for six months. Boom, give them that type of space for six months. And it's all amenities, all the resources they need, that type of thing. And it's kind of their space for six months. That creates that notion of ownership. They feel mm. that they own the space but it also keeps it in a flexible model. So I think we always look at free addresses being almost by the minute. It's like, you know, a, a, sure. A, it's like hotels by the hour, which are all creepy, you know? So, <laughs> it's like, so it's like, how do we get to the model that's a little bit more thinking about how it supports the projects or the work that's being engaged in mm -hmm. versus, you know, some weird clock that we're trying to put a timer to. There's a, a Valve, are you familiar with Valve? Mm -hmm. um, so Valve is a gaming company. Um, they they uh, created a game called um, Half Life that was very popular, and then they run a, a system called Steam, which is sort of a marketplace for games. And oh Valve, yeah, I know I, I know Steam. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah. Valve, the maker of Steam and Half Life, has this really strange hierarch like non hierarchical structure at at their company that has worked remarkably well in building a big business. And one of the key components is that all of their desks are on wheels mm -hmm. and that there is no management or they have their own version of management, but that teams self-assemble by moving their desks to one another mm -hmm. and then temporarily work on a game and whatever games or projects have steam, no pun intended, yeah. uh, they stay assembled for long periods of time until they eventually uh, break apart. Mm -hmm. That feels like an extreme concept, but it it seems like what you're describing is is somewhat similar. Is that is that a is that accurate? It's like these temporary yeah. project based or program based initiatives. Yeah, yeah. I I guess I I don't equate flexibility with in with casters. You know, so I, you know I think there's some inherent personal flexibility that people can engage and kind of move from space to space. But you know, I mean, another example. Actually, it was the same company as the water company. So it's kind of weird that we're going back to this where we designed exactly that. We gave them the components to configure, um, but I think back in the day, they were like in eight by 10 workstation cubicle mm -hmm. type things. And we said, you can put them anywhere you want. And almost to the tape measure, they put them in an eight by 10 configuration. So it was like- Fascinating. And, and one of the things that we realized, it was like, it's culture. I mean, it's just what these people were used to, right? So that's when we, as we looked at this notion of what we refer to as this workplace equation, as we look at research, the nature of work, the exponential factor to get to a solution is culture. So understanding culturally, what is the right makeup of a, of a setting, of a workplace, the design attributes that are gonna work you know, for some and not for others, it's really getting into that nut and then you can find a, 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 a clear solution for the, the, the teams, let alone the company you may be working for. Yeah, I, I think you actually, and I, I can't remember if it was a conversation that you and I were having, but we were talking about the office as a sandbox, where mm -hmm. it's like you have sort of all of the raw components and some framework for people to play in. And then what they bring to that space, uh, you allow some agility and sort of malleability of the space itself based on the needs or whatever it may be but there's still some type of structure to it. Um, I think we it, talked about it in the yeah. context of, you know, we, we talk about spontaneity and there was a big thing, you know, once again, pre-pandemic about spontaneous interactions, those types of things. That actually requires structure. 
You can't mm -hmm. be in asynchronous orbits and expect to 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 um, to collaborate. You know, so it's 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 this odd thing. How do you put in a light structural framework that allows serendipity to occur? That's always been kind of our our, our thinking in, uh, around it. It's not about being pres well, prescriptive and saying do this. It's about how's this light framework working to support the behavior you're trying to foster. I'm convinced that serendipitous interaction is like the root of all invention. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like offices are, and this is not my idea, this is many, many other people's ideas, but the, the thing that seems really profound about offices is facilitating a lot of that serendipitous interaction. Mm -hmm. How do you do that when 40% of your team is distributed? Yeah, that, that's, that becomes this whole notion about how we keep people constantly connected. You know, how do you do that from, a, um, from the structure that allows them to connect? Um, you know, it's like, yes, you may not be able to you know, meet in that corridor. Everyone feels comfortable right. walking through, right. but there's another vehicle for that. You know, and I agree totally. And it, I think the most revealing thing in this, you know, I observed last year, there was a, a, a bioinformation center um, down the peninsula that was built and interviewing one of the, the scientists. It was like, well, a lot of science happens informally. And you hear that and you're like, Phew. You know, it's like yeah, because you all you always think about you know science scientists yes. and labs and that type of thing. It's like yeah. you know, it, 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 he was just so calm and just you know matter of fact. It's like well, a lot of science happens informally. So yeah, but, um, but that but that was directly parlayed into how much the 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 folks on campus provided those informal spaces for science to occur in. Thin. So it was really meeting that need. All right. So in in sort of in closing. Um, I'm, uh, let's say I'm affiliated with portfolio administration, uh, workplace administration, or end occupant experience. Mm -hmm. And I want to engage in some of the ideas that you just talked about, but I'm not trained as a designer. I don't have background as a designer, and I want to make sure that I'm showing up with some credibility. What is the best way for me to bring these ideas into the problems that folks are going to be tackling at really large scale with really substantial urgency over the next three to six months as people come back to, to office? Well, you know, I'm going to be, you know, self-serving and say, you know, you know, call you, <laughs> you call me. well, not call me, but you know, either the whole thriving workplace information we dropped, I thought two things. Number one, it's, it's good content. It's applied to a plan. There's a VR plan that you can walk through that type of thing. But also, I mean, we're just one part of it. I mean, you know, you know, engage a good architecture and design firm that has the thinking that resonates with who you are as an organization, then they're going to bring really credible thinking to the table and, and they're, you know, and hopefully they'll bring us to the table with them and, and we can really think holistically about that. You know, one firm, you know, we work with very closely says it's always great when Noel's at the table because we think, you know, very similarly about these things. We don't try to think so prescriptively. We think holistically. We try to put things in place that make sense for an organization versus saying, hey, this is our product. It's going to work for you. Boom, move forward with it. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's it's engaging in that creative problem solving process. That's really what it's about. And my, my hope is that so many of these companies, they have to try something because what's happening, you know, yes, there are employees that are not in the office, but there's this whole, this other ecosystem of work, which are the, the cafes, the, the lunch places, the coffee shops, the janitorial staff, the, the people that service that office. Those are the people that are really hurting right now. Those are the ones, as Bill Maher said, the people that sit on their butts, look at a screen, they're not hurting right now. But the people that really were the ecosystem that made those offices vibrant, um, you know, those are the, those, and whatever we, that's our responsibility just as being good citizens to really, you know, say if we have the capital, let's make that move, let's experiment, let's try some pilots, let's get people moving again, and let's get, you know, some people back to work that really need to be back at work. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't agree more. And there's this great, um, there's this great uh, uh, point about when the Senate was called back into session back in, I don't know. September, October, November, something somewhere around there that um, there was a big hullabaloo about whether or not they should go back. And the reality is that when the senators came back, it meant that all the janitorial staff had to come back too. Exactly. So they're sort of making decisions that require others to adhere to them. I do want to call out though, that, you know, in December of 2020, a hundred percent of people who were, who dropped out of the workforce were women uh, mm -hmm. in the U S no. and 
I, I think it's, it feels like being able to work from home is easier than needing to go in, I think. But for a, a, a large portion of the population that are single parents, both men and women, but are single parents or are, I mean, I'm raising a six month old ch child care, being a full-time parent, a full-time educator because they're not going to school and a full-time colleague because I'm, we're all working full-time is something that I, I think is, um, can be easily overlooked. Uh, there are a I lot agree. of people I think who are working from home or sitting on their butts who, who are, who are also struggling, but I totally agree that there's a, sorry, my hair is also extremely long <laughs> because I That's haven't good. had a haircut. Had a haircut uh, in there, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, but I, I completely but I, I agree. agree but, I, but, but I think to that point, it's like understanding why we try to paint this with a broad brush, understanding the nuances of situations is so important. It's so important to understand that exactly what you spoke to. It's like, um, you know, people would always say, well, when are we going back to the office? It's like, okay, when are the schools going to fully reopen? Right. <laughs> because there is. They're it, in, it, inter interconnected. Yeah. It, it completely interconnected because caregivers really which are you know the parents in most cases you know they don't have that freedom to just say oh kids have free reign you know run the house i'll be gone i'm off to the office you know so it's all these things are interconnected then you look at transit systems the ability to get people to and fro all these things are so interconnected that's why we had a, a great session with one of our k talks with um the folks from spur about this expanded geography of work and how you know, the interconnection of our transit systems and our ability to transport people safely and, and all these things, it, it's just not one example. It's just not one solution. It's so multifaceted that we have to be considering. I have one last uh, question, just because mm -hmm. I, every time you're talking, I always have more questions. Uh, you talk about point in time design mm -hmm. versus iterative design. Um, can you uh, unpack that for me? What is What does it mean to be thinking about space as something that is evolving, not just, you know, I hire my architecture firm, I hire Noel to do furniture, I, you know, bring in my workplace strategists, and Bob's your uncle, I've got a new post pandemic office for the next I'm 10 done. years. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, I, I think that's shifting that mindset, you know, that there's, you know, I think historically, we always looked at it from the standpoint of, we're not creating monuments. You know, this isn't a monument to work that we're creating. What we're creating is a platform, and hopefully that platform has inherent in it the ability to change, morph, shift over time. Um, you know, and, and I know this sounds self-serving, and I apologize, but it's what uh, participants of our roundtables and customers have been telling us, saying they feel, you know, furniture as the flexible element of that architecture becomes more viable. You know, we look at it from a product development standpoint, if you're able to make a change to the workplace and or to our product, how do we look at the product in a, a three hour change, three day change or three week change? Mm. And how do you implement those types of variables or product solutions into a, an overall mix to make them as flexible as possible for the customer? I didn't hear, I didn't hear three product. month or three years. So I'm curious, are you, is there a limit to where, uh, well, we look at this for, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 I, 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 that's, that's a good point. We look at for the three week, you know, this is for product that we've designed and deployed, but to your point, is it a three month co-creation model that we can get into? Is it a three year new product development model that we can get into? Absolutely. I mean, those are equally important gotcha. threes in our portfolio. Cool. Um, you referenced a whole bunch of data. Um, uh, I think thr thriving, what was the name of the, Thriving Workplace, uh, yeah, we uh, we dropped that uh, content like uh, March 9th or something like that. So it's all on null.com. Uh, it's at our splash page. Um, you can download a, a deck. Uh, there should be a link to a VR. There's uh, images. And uh, I, I think it's a nice collection of content from a data standpoint, both uh, qualitative and quantitative. There's some great uh, anecdotes in there. Um, but also then how that was applied to basically this model building, which was a, about a 20, 20,000 square foot floor plate that we always kind of noodle with in the virtual world. So we've covered a whole bunch of different things, particularly in the design sort of uh, design thinking. If there's like one thing that you would hope folks kind of take away from uh, this conversation or these types of conversations, what would be the thing that, that you'd hope they bring back to their teams? Um, experiment. 
you know, start now, just, you know, put some things in play and trust your people's ability to interpret and give them and provide them a really good feedback loop and saying, hey, we're going to try this. And, you know, we may not have it right 100% of the time, but we want to hear from you and we're going to put this in place. It's based on good knowledge. Um, let us hear how you think it's going to be. And, but let's start doing something. And I think the time is right. I think there's pent up, there's really pent, pent up demand from a standpoint that some, you know, we've heard from, from companies that say, I don't know if I'm allowed to go into my office, but I want to, so um, give them that opportunity to come back to someplace different. Tracy, it's a pleasure. It's an honor. I like absolutely love talking to you every time. Thank you so much for making the time to, to, to be here with us today. Andrew, it's always mutual. Thank you. All right, folks. Uh, we'll see you next time. Um, thanks so much for spending time with us. See you later. All right. Thank you.